Special master debate continues in the Trump Mar-a-Lago saga. Donald Trump and his defense team are now contesting some of the government's categorization of the materials that they seized during the raid of their home. We're going to go through a document that was filed very, very recently on the docket, and it's about seven pages from the U.S. Department of Justice that's summarizing both sides of this case. And if you recall, we had the raid of Trump's residence. They took a bunch of materials. The judge in the case, her name is Eileen Cannon. She appointed a special master who's sort of like a referee over these documents. And the referee said to both sides, we're going to have a debate over the materials. We see seize 15 boxes, thousands of pages of materials, and we need to decide what is what. So they said to one side, okay, why don't you go through the list and you tell us what you think it is. And then you give it over to Donald Trump and his team. And then he's going to say what he thinks it is. And if there's a debate about this, let us know. So for example, if the prosecution says that this is attorney client privileged and, or, or vice versa, let's say they say this is not protected by attorney client privilege. And they, and Donald Trump says, well, I'm looking at the document. I think it is attorney client privilege because it's a letter between me and my lawyer or whatever. That's a debate. Prosecutor says it's this. The defense says it's that. And they have to rectify this. And the special master was appointed to do so. So now that we have that bearing, we can see that even in this image, there is a bunch of highlighted materials and several different points of disagreement, which we will go through shortly. But first, let's take a quick look at the most recent entries on the docket. This is the docket from Donald Trump versus the United States. Remember, it's assigned to Judge Cannon. He is suing the United States. He wanted the appointment of the special master. We took this case all the way up to the Supreme Court. They agreed that they were not going to hear it. They sent it back down to the 11th Circuit. And the 11th Circuit now it has already issued a ruling on portions of the special master order. But they're now going to be appealing. Well, the, the prosecution is appealing the entire order to remove the special master entirely. So they won a little victory and now they're going for the whole shebang. But this is the most recent update. We had different entries last week, but you can see on October 20th, there's an update. The court is letting us know that, oh, all right, well, we got those 11th Circuit Clerk of the Court records and the record is complete for the purposes of the appeal, right? Everything has been transferred. Government wins. It all comes back down. And now the, the district court will proceed as usual. The other entry is this, the notice by the United States of America on filter A document disputes coming in from U.S. government official Julie Edelstein. And this hit the docket October 20th. And so let's take a look at that material. U.S. Department of Justice from the National Security Division sends a letter over to the special master. We remember Judge Raymond Deary was appointed by Judge Eileen Cannon. He is a judge from the District of New York. He's got a lot of experience on the FISA court and so on. This letter is drafted October 20th. It's seven pages long and it's an update. They say, hey, Judge Deary, guess what? We've got some news. In response to your order, the special master entered an order back on docket entry 138. They say that the government met with Trump's lawyers on these materials. And just like you asked us to in your order, we did this so that we could confer and attempt to resolve or narrow the disputes regarding the claims of executive privilege and Presidential Records Act designations. And so zooming out, we talked about the different protections that Trump is asserting. He's trying to build this force field around these documents to say, no, you can't take them. They're mine. They're declassified. They're executively privileged. They're attorney client privileged. They're personal records that are outside of the purview of the Presidential Records Act. He's got all these force fields that he's trying to raise up. And he's doing that, you would presume, for a whole litany of documents, every, basically everything, because he said that he didn't break the law in any way, shape or form. And the documents that they're saying are contested, he's really making those claims about those. And no, 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 those are not those are not confidential. They're declassified and so on. So they had this meeting, they conferred and they came back and they give us this update. They say the remaining disputes regarding those 15 documents are listed below in the table. We've got 17 log reference numbers omitting references 5, 10 equals 15 documents and disputes that are to be resolved by you, Special Master Deary. We need your help on these. They're highlighted in yellow. Okay, so everything else that's sort of not highlighted is okay. 
but the stuff that is highlighted, apparently Special Master Deary needs to get involved in. And so let's go through some of this. Now, not a lot of material to really dissect. You can see it's a big spreadsheet. We talked about this. It's going to be a big bunch of spreadsheets. I mean, there's a lot of spreadsheets that happen in the law. You think it's a lot of just Word documents and, you know, big walls of text, a lot of tables, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of, it's just, it's, uh, you get the gist. Here, they tell us what each one is. Reference to document number one, don't know what it is. Bates numbers, those are just sort of identification numbers that are used in the law. And we have document categorizations. So the dispute is plaintiff says that these are personal records while the government says that these are presidential records. Oh, you're kidding me. We talked about this issue at length and we had a debate about this. The question was, who has the authority to classify these things? And when Bill Clinton had this debate, remember, the D.C. Circuit Court communicated that he has the presumption of having discretion to make those decisions. Because how do you tell a president, the most powerful executive in the whole country, uh, that you can't do that thing? President says these are personal records. They're not presidential. And they say, OK, well, uh, I'm more powerful than you. So I say they're not. And this is where we run into these issues. So Trump is going to say all of these things were personal. And there's a provision in the Presidential Records Act, right? These are official official categorizations of materials. Presidential Records Act also, by many interpretations, articulates a remedy when there's a breach, which is civil. It's a resolution between the sides. NARA, the National Archives, communicates over with the offending outgoing president and they rectify the whole thing. They don't turn into the FBI that raids the houses of ex-officials because that's insane in this country. But they did that. Box two, document two, same dispute. Now there's another dispute here about the privilege status as to executive privilege. So we've got the documents and then whether you can apply a filter over that that sort of adds another force field. So they're, they're fighting about this document. They're saying, uh, well, it's, we say it's personal. You say it's presidential. And they say, not only is it personal, but Trump says it's also executively privileged, right? So it's a personal document, so you can't have it. And it's also privileged, so you can't see it anyways. The government says no as to both counts. Down the line, say the same thing, personal records versus presidential. But on the executive privilege, they agree. Trump's got no executive privilege over item two. Same story, item three, item four, same deal. Personal records, Trump, presidential records, government. No claims of executive privilege. But as to item six, both are in issue. So item seven and item eight, portion of those are the same claims. And the rest of this is not all that interesting, right? You can just see there's all sorts of layers of disputes. Now, the government does agree as to some of these. They say, yeah, uh, A53, is personal records and A54, yep, that's personal records too. 16 personal records. There are some of these where they agree that there is, well, actually, it looks like they, looks like I don't see anywhere where the government agreed that there was claims of executive privilege. So they basically, throughout this entire, throughout this entire list, they have never once agreed that there was any executive privilege. No privilege, no claim, no claim, no claim, no, no, no. Part of the document withheld because the case team, okay, work product. So some of this stuff is being withheld because of attorney work, uh, attorney privilege, attorney client privilege and work product doctrine, but they are not saying that anything constitutes executive privilege at all. But it's funny that they do acknowledge that some of these are personal records. So yeah, pres uh, presidential records, presidential records. So Trump agrees with them. It seems like Trump's being pretty accommodating here. Trump agreed, no claims of privilege here. Trump says, yeah, no, I agree. It's, I think there's privilege on this, but not on that. Says, I agree, this is presidential, that's personal. Very reasonable. The government doesn't, uh, doesn't accept executive privilege on anything. Mm. Typical. Now, they continue after they give us the detail of uh, all of the materials that they have debates about. And remember, Special Master Raymond Deary, he's going to come in here and he's going to sort through all of this, right? He's gonna, they're going to send these materials to him. A19 to A20, it's going to go over to him and he's going to sit there and make a decision, classify it one way or the other. That's providing that that gets done 
before the 11th Circuit comes back out and revokes his ability to even be appointed to the case, which I still think is going to happen. I think the 11th Circuit comes back down and they overrule Judge Cannon's order and we don't even have a special master anymore. And the DOJ just gets to do literally whatever they want as long as they want with no referee, no oversight, because that's the system that we live in. And, it, and it's not just because it involves Trump. It's just the DOJ in general. Trump's just added bonus to this. The DOJ really gets to do sort of whatever they want, right? This is just the deal. Same with prosecutor's office, even, even locally. They just run roughshod over the whole process. Judges, you know, just oh, whatever they want to do. So it's not a big surprise that, you know, Trump is sort of on the receiving end of this, but certainly because Trump is involved, the DOJ is going to make it hurt a little bit more because they are political enemies of him and they want him removed from the playing field. So now that we have a big giant list of the disputes that exist, the government continues updating the special master on page three. Government says, the balance of this letter provides reasons and authority for why the government believes that these disputes are presidential records and why they're not the subject of executive privilege. And we refer to these documents by their numbers and do not reference privilege content so that we can file this on the public docket, which is very nice of them. That means we can read it. Thank you. Now, they explain their rationale. They say, when it comes to document categorization and we have a debate about presidential versus personal records, they detail nine disputes for us. The prosecutors tell us, they say, of the 15 documents, the parties agree on the categorization of six, and we disagree as to nine. Trump categorizes those documents as personal records, citing the Presidential Records Act and a district court case, which we've read here. We've gone through this one at length. Judicial Watch versus NARA came out of the D.C. Circuit Court. This is the Clinton sock drawer case. And the site there is sort of saying that for personal records, they are records designated personal consistent with the Presidential Records Act. They're saying that's our authority to say that these are Trump's. Because other courts said that those were Clinton's. That's why it's called precedent. And that's why he did what he did. So the government says, well, for our part, the government categorizes those nine documents as presidential records. Why? They say that, number one, they're documentary material. So they're recording things. They're documenting materials. Number two, that these are items that were created or received by the president and that the president should retain. And that number three, these are sort of the statutory elements, that in the course of conducting activities which relate to or have an effect of carrying out the duties of the president, they are corresponding to those things. So three things. It documents something. It was done, received, created, sort of in the wheelhouse of the president, and it relates to the duties of the president. Got it. Which is like a gigantic, broad scope, basically anything. Okay, if like Trump had lunch and he wrote down an order, I want a hamburger and a Coke, French fries, whatever. I mean, he's got to have lunch to have duty, you know, to, to sit down and perform his duties and he's having lunch with somebody else. I guess that's a presidential record. I guess, I'll, you, know, you know, he can't keep that receipt when he writes on there, you know, lunch with Kim Jong-un or something. It's crazy. So in, in other words, this can be anything that they want. So it goes on. It says, one, government prosecutors continue. They say, the nine documents are documentary material because it does, without limitation, it does define this term broadly. It includes basically everything. Okay, so they're acknowledging it. They're saying, you know, they're saying, look at the law. The law is extremely broad. It says it includes, without limitation, all correspondence, memoranda, documents, papers, analog, digital, or any other form. You see the word all right here. You see the word any right there. They're acknowledging it. They're saying, yeah, I mean, we could drive a truck through this thing. Okay, if I want Trump's, you know, grandmother's secret recipes, I'm going to get those. Those nine documents also appear to have at least been received by the president. They're saying we get the second element there or by a member of his staff. So again, everything, anything that's going on there is so broad. And lastly, those nine documents appear to have been created or received by Trump in the course of the activities that relate upon the carrying out of his duties. Six of the nine documents are clemency requests. Oh, that's interesting. So we get some more detail about what these things are. And they say that these are 
accompanied with supporting materials, and they relate to Trump's power under the Constitution to grant pardons. And so because they're clemency requests, they say those are related to him at, in his professional capacity as president and not his personal capacity, right? These aren't like birthday cards. These are official clemency requests with supporting materials. And so it's interesting that Trump kept them. I wonder who they're from. And I wonder if he granted them or not. But uh, to be honest with you, those don't sound like anything that's national security uh, problematic, anything at all. So I don't know why they would even take those in the first place. Oh, yeah. Because these are library books. These are overdue library books. You know, Trump may have wanted to keep them for some memento purposes. Oh, look who asked me for something, right? Or look at this correspondence or look what I tried to do or look what I did. And apparently that warrants the raid of his house. Yeah, for national security purposes, because God forbid that somebody gets their hands on this. Who knows what Kim Jong-un could have done if, if he would have found those. Now, two of the nine documents relate to immigration initiatives. Wow. And the president's power is under Immigration and nationally, Nationality Act and other laws governing the border. Wow. Shocking. Holy moly. I feel like I can't believe he had these things. Although Trump claims that both these documents are personal and not presidential, he also inconsistently asserts executive privilege over both of those materials and says that uh, they, they say that it applies, you know, the protections apply to presidential materials, not personal records. Got it. And the last of the nine documents, oh, okay, oh my goodness, let's see what this is. It is a printed email message from a person at one of the military academies. Oh, this is going to be juicy, right? Nuclear materials. Finally, are we going to get to it? addressed to the president in his official capacity. <gasps> <gasps> What's it about? Oh, it's about the Academy's sports program and its relationship to the martial spirit. Oh, great. Uh, the message relates to, at minimum, they say, quote, the ceremonial duties of the president. <laughs> These people are such dorks. The ceremonial duties of the president. Yeah, we got to keep these materials. These are presidential records. These are library books, overdue library books. It's a letter from a, 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 an academy, a military academy about sports. Better raid his property. We're all going to die. The single district court case, says the prosecutor, on which Trump relies, which is the Clinton sock drawer case, does not prove that any of the nine documents were records designated as personal consistent with the act. As Trump asserts in his log entries, they write, the district court in Judicial Watch held that a third party cannot bring a claim to compel the production of those records. Okay, so they're distinguishing it between NARA. In the case of Judicial Watch versus NARA, it was a third party suing NARA, right? Judicial Watch is a private entity. Tom Fitton, shout out to everybody over there. They do great work. But it's not part of the government. So they're distinguishing that from a situation in which the government wants their records back. They say they're theirs. So they're saying Trump was not asked for the records by Judicial Watch, which is a private third party. But Trump was asked for by NARA, which has a better claim than him. But that's not what the case said. The case said that the president is the person who gets the authority to declare what is or, or not presidential or personal. And NARA theoretically, would still have to go through, you know, they're the entity that would pull those records and they're still obligated through the Freedom of Information Act request that Judicial Watch did file. So NARA is still compelled under the law to obtain documents that are supposed to be in their possession. But what the court said is that they're not supposed to be in their possession. Why? Because Bill Clinton had the discretion, the decision-making ability as the president of the United States to make that decision. If you take that away from him, then you make the person who gets authority over that decision, you give them more power than the president. And the judge noted that. She said it would be insane. How could we enforce this? What do you want me to do? Go and tell Bill Clinton to pull those things out of his drawers? I can never do that, she said. Enforceability, separation of powers, it's nuts. But they're doing it in this case because they control the DOJ. They control Congress. They know that they have a corrupt DC circuit court jurisdiction that's going to do whatever they want, including covering up for all of their democratic operatives like Michael Sussman, Christopher Steele, and Igor Dangchenko. But they're going to go through here and they'll tell us it's distinguishable. It's not the same case because Judicial Watch was a third party. And in this case, it's the official government. However, Judicial Watch through the FOIA request, you know, should have been able to compel NARA to do it if that was the actual standard. But of course, it's not. Now, they have four disputes about executive privilege. Prosecutors tell us, they say, 
Of the 15 documents, Trump does not assert executive privilege over 11. Trump asserts claims over four documents, 1, 6, 15, and 16. And in his log entries, Trump's claim, Trump claims that the documents 1 and 6 are pre-decisional. And he invokes a deliberative process component of the executive privilege. So when you start talking about, you know, a, a privilege, most people are sort of familiar with attorney uh, client work product or attorney client privilege. When you start talking about the actual communications, some of those materials are not actually protected, right? So like, for example, if you send a text message to your lawyer, somebody sends me a message and they say, hey, Rob, uh, you know, I was just, I know you're representing me on a burglary case, but uh, I, I know, you know, I didn't do that one, but I was thinking about doing another one. Uh, what, what, how should I perform my next robbery? And I say, well, uh, the last one you got busted because you did this. In this case, you should probably do this one. And, and you know, it's, uh, put a mask on, go around the back this time and make sure that you trip the alarm. Okay, whatever you see in Hollywood. Go do that and then you'll be safe. Guess what? That's me talking to them about the furtherance of a crime. And so we don't get protection over that. Attorneys don't just get to sort of have this blanket force field that they just get to pop up over the place. And so same thing applies to executive privilege, right? Trump doesn't get to say that anything is privileged. He's got to go through those different conversations, those individual communications, emails, or whatever documents, and say, this is why that falls within the umbrella of executive privilege. So Trump says that 15 and 16, those record communications between Trump and his advisors. Sounds kind of like material uh, for those documents. And he says that those invoke the presidential communication of executive privilege. So 15 of 16 records are between Trump and his advisors. Sounds like it might be absolutely privileged, right? Just on that basis alone. Let's see what the government says. They write, as stated in its log entry, the government incorporates by reference its submissions on this issue that we threw it over to the 11th Circuit. And with respect to those four documents, they say Trump may not assert executive privilege for four reasons. Number one. They say Trump cannot logically assert executive privilege over two of the documents, number 15 and number 16, because the parties agree that those documents are personal and not presidential records. Only official records can be privileged. Okay, so they're saying there's sort of a logical uh, incongruency there. Trump said that they're my personal documents, so I can't have executive privilege over them, but he's saying they are executively privileged either way. So, and that's going to be a technical term of art, right? That the law is going to, and the special master will make a distinction on that. So Trump is saying, okay, if it's, Trump is saying, this is kind of, this is kind of shady, I think a little bit. Hang on a second. So let's go back up here and just pause on this moment. So 15 and 16. Okay, so they agree. Now that's actually not that shit. I thought they were going to be disagreeing on these boxes. They're not. They're agreeing here. So they're agreeing that they're personal. <laughs> I thought they were trying to have it both ways, but they're not. But they continue. They say, second, plaintiff offers no authority, Trump meaning, that a former president may assert this type of privilege over these materials. They say the Supreme Court's decision reserving the question about whether a former president can invoke executive privilege, those were limited to presidential communications privileges and not the deliberative process privilege. Okay, so again, Spreadsheets, go through the document. What is this email? Is this an email? Is it a communication between Trump and Pence? Or is it an email or is it, or is it information about a deliberative process where they're debating about these things, right? And they're, 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 they sound very similar, but they're different justifications for getting the information in, not necessarily the document, but the information. So they're saying only one of those applies. The other one doesn't apply. And they, they cite some cases for that. They say, third, for the reasons and authority stated in prior submissions, they say Trump may not assert executive privilege to withhold documents from itself. The special master flagged that issue in a prior case. They say the illogic and absence of any authority to evoke executive privilege is fatal to the assertion in the documents previously. Okay. Fourth, even if plaintiff were permitted to assert executive privilege against the executive branch. Yeah, okay, so we, we, we've covered basically these arguments. These are the same arguments that are, are, I think, sitting with the 11th Circuit. This one, you know, a demonstrated need. So they say we need it badly, and that overrides Trump's claims of privilege. We sort of have the hierarchy of the different privileges. You've got 
several different force fields that Trump tries to put up. And the government is saying, we can knock this one out. And then it, when it defaults to another one, we're going to knock that one out. And when it defaults to another one, we're going to knock that one out. But they say here, if we absolutely need it, it can override all of those other possible protections. And they're referencing U.S. versus Nixon. It's written by... The U.S. government, I believe Julie Edelstein was the prosecutor who signed this. They say, thank you for your consideration. Submit it over to the court. So this means that Special Master Raymond Deary will then be taking a look at these spreadsheets and taking a look at the documents and then making decisions. And so we'll expect to see an order where he comes back and he says something. He'll say document four. It's personal, or he'll say it's presidential. And my guess is a lot of it's going to be presidential. And then we'll see what Trump does about that. Because those categorizations, I'm sure, are going to be appealed as well. But that is the big, big update from the prosecutors. A lot of disputes coming from Trump and the DOJ landing on the desk of Raymond Deary, the special master. Trump's lawyer, Alina Abba, wonders why Trump is facing possible charges and nobody else is. What about Clinton? What about Obama? What about all these other people who also took documents but aren't facing the wrath of their political opponents through the DOJ? Let's remember, they didn't bring charges for Hillary. They didn't bring charges for Bill. They didn't bring charges for anybody that's shoving things down their pants oh. or in their sock drawers or smashing phones yeah, and bleaching like servers. But if it's Donald Trump, there is a double standard. It is completely despicable. We have to get this country back on track. It's really upsetting. And the investigation will continue and continue and continue. And they're just going to let it be as painful as possible so that they can win elections. Meanwhile, we saw entirely different sagas with other elected officials who did, many would argue, much more reprehensible things like intentionally covering up and deleting materials, setting up entire servers and closets with nefarious intent to try to escape oversight. And they're saying, well, it's not a big deal. Didn't raid her home. Definitely got to raid Trump's though. Double standards in our justice system. But what is Alina talking about? What are some of these double standards that exist? We remember Jeb Bush, Guac Bowl Jeb. Remember when he was running for president for a little bit? Kind of hysterical time. Jeb Bush, Jeb Bush confirms that Donald Trump may have some legitimacy in his Mar-a-Lago claims. They were at his residence down in South Florida, but Bush apparently brought his materials not to a resort on the beach. He brought them to an abandoned bowling alley. Bless his heart. I mean, this was kind of a weird accusation. The National Archives, um, when they're building uh, these presidential libraries, have to find a place to store all of the documents that are going to go into the archives a lot at, the, of materials. At, these, at the presidential libraries. And this was an uh, abandoned bowling alley that they fixed up, that they secured, that had all the security necessary to make sure that that um, uh, national security matters were, were protected. And they used that uh, to build out the presidential library, just as every other president bowling has done alley. as well. And I, you know, I think the added little feature of the Chinese restaurant, you know, kind of makes it all uh, easier for the conspiratorialists to get all. Well, hot was and bothered, it a Chinese but... restaurant as well? That part lost me. I, I, I do remember was about it a Chinese? temporary storage facility <laughs> as the library was being built. In fact, I distinctly remember that. But w where did that come from? And yeah, was he insinuating that that your your yeah. your father had a link to China there? I, I did. What did you What did you think? I think it, I think that's what he's trying to do. It's uh, it was uh, a little too subtle for me to completely grab. But that's true. Uh, yeah. The, the, the fact is that uh, I think what he wants to say is, is there, you know, everybody does it. Basically, everybody takes documents and stores them at their, you know, at their hotel or in a bowling alley and that he didn't do anything wrong. Whether he did or didn't, I don't know. But the simple fact is that uh, equating the National Archives employees doing their duty uh, in the proper way uh, is a far cry from keeping uh, national security papers in the in Mar a Lago. Okay, Guac Bowl Jeb. Everybody, let's take a moment. Please clap. Please clap for Jeb. Please clap. Please. 
poor guy having a tough time. But he makes an interesting point, you know, if he's able to keep all of the documents at a bowling alley with a Chinese restaurant and not get raided by the FBI, well, why is Donald Trump then? Seems like double standards exist, or maybe he's just part of the establishment that plays by a whole entirely different set of rules. Doesn't really matter whether Trump is a Republican or not. He's the wrong Republican. Shouldn't, of course, get the same benefits that the Bush family dynasty gets. That's guac bowl jeb. Now we're asking ourselves about potential criminal charges. And we have this Harvard law professor, Lawrence Tribe, who went to Harvard, which apparently means he's smart or something, is saying that I know a lot about Merrick Garland. He used to be my student at Harvard. I taught him everything he knows. And when push comes to shove, he is going to prosecute Trump. Uh, you've known Merrick Garland since he was uh, one of your law students. Uh, I know you've read that Atlantic piece today uh, predicting that Merrick Garland will decide to indict Donald Trump in this case. What is your expectation? I do expect exactly the same thing. Oh. Because to his very core, Merrick Garland believes in the rule of law. Oh, gosh. People call him an institutionalist, but he's told me, and I think he told Franklin Foer, that he doesn't use that term for himself. That sounds sort of like a bureaucrat, though, in prettier clothes. He is but a bureaucrat. He is committed to law to following the law where it leads to the reality-based world as opposed to the fantasy-based world. And the law and the facts here inexorably lead to conclusions about the president having taken government documents that don't belong to him, having stored them illegally in unsafe places, having apparently attempted to use them as bargaining chips telling the government at various points, if you want some of these things back, you want me to turn them over to the National Archives, why don't you give me some of the FBI records that are involved in my supposed dealings with Russia, transactional down to the bone. It seems to me that in these circumstances, it's clear that all three of the crimes that led to the search and seizure, oh, three God. alleged crimes, are strongly Library provable, books. including obstruction of justice. And that's not even to mention the grave crimes involving seditious conspiracy and insurrection. <laughs> so the real questions before there Merrick Garland are not whether to indict. We're always waiting for the dangers to American democracy, the death of us all. He says they're not thinking about indicting. It's about when they're indicting. But when and where and for which crimes, where he'll have to decide whether to indict in Washington, D.C., which, by the way, he could do even over the Mar-a-Lago offenses, because they began when he took the documents illegally from the White House in Washington. Which they absolutely will. When Trump does get indicted, it will be in the D.C. circuit because that's home field advantage. They know that they've got the entire game fixed there in the judicial system and that any type of prosecution of a Trump ally is going to be met with repercussions. We've already seen a history of it here. The favorable defendants, the people who support the Democrats, they walk away without even so much as a slap on the wrist. Michael Sussman, acquitted. Igor Danchenko, acquitted. Steve Bannon, not even allowed to present a defense, guilty. Same story is going to go on with Donald Trump. So of course, they're going to try to bring the indictment out of the DC circuit court. But my goodness, Lawrence Tribe, he has a difficult time with Donald Trump. You can see he's one of these people who has been saying for years that the clock is ticking. Tick tock, tick tock. Sounds like Sean Hannity. That every next six months, there's going to be the indictment. It's all going to come crashing down. We've been listening to this for years now. It's going to be a decade. But I think this time there really is some energy behind it because they are petrified to death that Donald Trump might win again. Donald Trump was also deposed in a lawsuit that we had not seen. This wasn't even on our radar. Bloomberg reports that Donald Trump sat down for another deposition, an, ap uh, an apprentice video phone 
deposition. This came out and nobody really knew about this until this was broken by Eric Larson. Lawyers for investors who claimed they were defrauded by Trump more than a decade ago finally got the chance to ask him about it. Okay, a decade ago, another claim from a decade ago. Gosh, finally got the chance to depose him. It was about a joint failed video phone venture that was done back on Celebrity Prentice. A New York judge had ordered Trump to sit four questions on the video phone case. It all got delayed because of Hurricane Ian. In one of several depositions Trump had to sit for recently, he was deposed in a separate case on Wednesday. That one we did talk about. That was with E. Jean Carroll, that interesting woman yesterday who said that it was a kind of a thrilling experience or something. She alleges he raped her in a department store. He denied it. He sat down for the deposition yesterday. But in this separate case, Trump and his company and his three oldest children were sued in 2018 for investors claiming they were duped into paying thousands of dollars for a doomed video phone device. Clunky devices are made obsolete by smartphones. As we complete fact discovery, it's an important case, they say. Trump has denied wrongdoing, arguing this was a risk-free investment and any reasonable investor would, you know, it's, it's an investment. So people make and lose money in investments. The case is called McCoy versus Trump. So apparently he sat down for an interview on that one. Don't know much about what the deposition looked like, there were other stories that Trump did not uh, actually invoke his Fifth Amendment uh, rights yesterday at the deposition with E. Jean Carroll. Apparently, you know, a bunch of I didn't. Nope, didn't do it. Never happened. And that's a little bit different than what happened with Letitia Tishy James when he was invoking his Fifth Amendment rights, I think, about 400 plus times. So uh, interesting updates there. Now, we know that there are, in fact, two tiers of justice because Trump is under criminal investigation. Meanwhile, others are acquitted. Igor Dangchenko, which we did not cover in depth on this channel. Other people have done a great job on that. In particular, uh, Technofog right, has done an amazing final write-up on this if you want to go read more about it. But he was acquitted and not unexpected. Everybody was sort of presuming this was going to be the case. People were hoping it would not be the case. But because this is taking place out of the D.C. circuit, we know the game is rigged there. We know that they get off scot-free while everybody else, if you're a J6 defendant, for example... Don't even have to think about it. You just walk in there guilty immediately. But Igor, if you recall, he was the guy who was the source to Christopher Steele. Christopher Steele was the guy who compiled the Steele dossier, which was the Trump PP tape hoax that they fumbled, uh, uh, funneled over to Fusion GPS. Fusion GPS was run by, well, it's all on our j6mindmap.com. It's all detailed there. We spent a lot of time on this, but they were a contractor for really Perkins Coy, which was the law firm that was hired for Hillary Clinton. Michael Sussman worked there and the guy who runs Democracy Docket, Mark Elias, also works worked there. They're not there anymore. But they were there and all of this was funneled up. Michael Sussman took Igor Danchenko's report and tried to feed that over to Jim Baker at the FBI. He's now over at Twitter conveniently, or he was. And all of this was done to try to push back against Donald Trump. They were trying to create this idea of Russian collusion that was all BS from day one. But they needed a story because Hillary was drowning in her email saga. Everybody was watching her corruption put out on display. And they said, oh, gosh, we got to change the narrative. We really got to do something about this. So we better create another fictional story about Trump and try to shove that down everybody's gullet. Then they took it to the FBI, tried to sell it to them, while they simultaneously tried to sell it to the media while they were playing both sides. All rigged, all total, total scam. And these people get away with it. So Igor Danchenko acquitted, judge, you know, made a bunch of rulings. You have your opinions on special counsel Durham or Bill Barr or any of these people. I think they are lifelong DOJers who are more interested in protecting the institution than they are in protecting Donald Trump or rooting out evil, nefarious actors within these age-old institutions like the DOJ or the FBI. They'd rather just, eh, you know, cover it up and move on to the next case. Meanwhile, they go on the shows, they write a report, a memo, they write a book, they do a bunch of talk shows, and that's it. It all gets papered over. Donald Trump's no better off. He's worse off because there was no justice. And they just get to go on. The car just keeps driving right down the road. Trump gets sidelined. No justice. The corrupt FBI gets to continue on along with their partners in crime over at the DOJ. But Igor gets acquitted. Total joke. 
we have reaction from senators. Senator Marsha Blackburn recognizes that there are two tiers of justice that exist in our country. Igor Dangchenko, somebody clearly culpable in all sorts of misdeeds with the FBI, acquitted, and she's recognizing that there are problems with how our justice system works. You know, I think from this, we have learned that there are indeed two tiers of justice. We know that D.C. is a swamp. It's yeah. full of people that are going to try to protect the FBI and the institutions. We do know that Hillary Clinton was involved in this, this Russia hoax. All this came from her campaign. The FBI knew that this was false. They wanted to take down Donald Trump so badly that they were willing to pay Christopher Steele a million dollars if he could verify what he was getting a and they put Danchenko bucks. on the payroll and kept him there for a few years and I think it is going to be interesting to see what Durham's next steps are Nothing. but what the American people are gaining from this is insight into exactly how corrupted you're hearing this, this from your voters and your district. oh yes yeah. and i'm talking to tennesseans every single day mm -hmm. what they know is there's two tiers of justice clinton was involved in this uh, they paid for it they tried to push it over uh, they had this narrative they wouldn't let it go they wanted to take down president trump so she is dead right about this two tiers of justice trump gets one set Everybody else gets a separate set. She seems to be encouraged by the fact that apparently Americans are waking up. Some of her constituents are hearing more about this. I certainly agree that people are recognizing that the FBI is a corrupt institution, that it has become a hyper-partisan, overly politicized weapon of, at this point, the Democratic Party. But I don't think that's quite enough that people sort of know that the people who are the bad actors, the guys like Mark Elias, who were working with Michael Sussman, the guys who, in my opinion, were responsible for creating these entire schemes, they are still out there. They're still kind of doing the same stuff. They're still scheming around. In fact, they have entire organizations built for it. And there were, were no criminal convictions. We're going to get a report that some of us will read. But everybody else who is on the other side, who is responsible for all of the corruption, they're just going to turn right around and they're going to say, yeah, but nobody was convicted of that. I mean, it was a political investigation. So uh, they investigated it. Nobody did anything wrong. So what are you complaining about? Right. That's exactly what they're going to do. And a lot of people are going to buy that. And it's not very satisfactory as far as I can tell. Ron Johnson confirming that when the Republicans are back in charge, there's going to be a lot of oversight going after the FBI and the DOJ, recognizing that what they have done to this country is not sustainable and something must be done. Uh, I think these trials were really more about the FBI corruption. I think the reason Michael Sussman and Igor Danchenko were acquitted is because the jury found that the FBI was the more corrupt actor in their uh, what they did. So we need to get to the bottom of this. This is unsustainable in democracy where we have the federal law enforcement agency politicized, uh, our Department of Justice, a uh, partisanship showing, and, and just corruption throughout. It's it's awful. It's, it's That is the danger to democracy. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Strzok. Wow. It's your corrupt actions that, that uh, are a threat to our democracy. Peter Strzok was with the FBI, also highly involved in many of these ordeals. But Johnson saying that the FBI must be held accountable and he's implying that when the Republicans are back in charge, he may be behind a lot of those efforts. We have Jim Jordan, who's also putting some pressure on the FBI. You may remember Jill Sanborn. Jill Sanborn used to work at the FBI. She's not there anymore. Jim Jordan wants to talk to her, though, and we hope that he does. Let's re refresh our recollection here on the program about who Jill Sanborn is. Former FBI agent Jill Sanborn was brought in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. She got asked a very interesting question by Ted Cruz. How many FBI agents were there involved in the alleged insurrection? And who the heck is that Ray Epps guy, Jill? How many FBI agents or confidential informants actively participated in the events of January 6th? Yeah. Sir, I'm sure you can appreciate that I 
can't go into the specifics of sources and methods. Uh, did any you know, FBI did agents any FBI or agents confidential or informants confidential actively, actively participate in the events of January 6th? Yes, yes or no? Sir, I can't, I can't answer that. Did any of FBI course. agents did or confidential agents informants not? commit crimes of violence on January 6th? 6th. I can't answer that, sir. Did any FBI agents any F or FBI informants actively encourage and incite crimes of violence on January 6th? Yeah. 6th. Come on. Sir, come I on. can't answer that. Oh, come on, Jill. Ms. Sadburn, Ms. who is Ray Epps? Ooh. Yeah. I'm aware of the individual, sir. Uh, yeah, we know you are. I don't have the specific background to him. Uh, of course you don't. Well, that's interesting because he was on the FBI's most wanted list until you took him off. Maybe that's because he was one of yours, not an insurrectionist like nobody else was either. But did you see her face there? That little, you know, this one catches me every time. That little, this one right there. Look at that. There it is. This little, uh, no, no idea. Ray Epps. Ooh, doop, doop, uh, no idea who that is. Let's listen one more time. I'm aware of the individual, sir. Uh, no. I don't have the specific background to him. No idea. No idea who that is. That's Jill Sanborn. Now, she was at the FBI. Evidently, she's not there anymore. But Jim Jordan wants to talk to her. And so let's take a look at what that letter looks like. Representative Jim Jordan sends a letter over to now Miss Jill Sanborn, not Special Agent Jill Sanborn, not FBI Agent Jill Sanborn, none of that. And it's care of her lawyers over at De Bevois and Plimpton. Oh, great. What a great law firm name that is. It comes out on October 18th from the United States House of Representatives, the Judiciary Committee, written by Jim Jordan, ranking member. He says, hey, Jill, on August 10th, we wrote to you requesting that you appear for a transcribed interview concerning your actions while employed at the FBI. Although your attorneys claimed, quote, that you quote, want to be responsive to our request, you failed to take any meaningful steps to arrange your transcribed interview for over two months. Only late last Friday did your attorneys offer a specific date for a transcribed interview, conveniently on December 2nd, a date six weeks in the future and nearly four months since our initial request. December 2nd, that's after the midterms, convenient. Your attorneys have maintained that a forthcoming letter from the FBI will fully respond to our request and obviate the need for your testimony. You should know, however, that we do not agree with your lawyers. As committee staff has informed your attorneys, our request to you for a transcribed interview is separate and distinct from the request for documents that we've made to the FBI and the DOJ. Your attorneys have also suggested that the FBI must approve your appearance for a transcribed interview. Uh, but Jill, you should be aware that here too, we do not share your attorney's view. Every federal employee or former employee has a right to speak with Congress without interference, intimidation, or obstruction for him or her is employing agency. And to the extent that the FBI is or has been preventing your ability to respond to our request in a timely and comprehensive manner, manner we will be interested in examining these facts during your transcribed interview. We're going to ask you all about that. We're going to ask you about the FBI and what they said you could or could not do and who said you could or could not do those things and when they said those things. You have had, Jill, over two months to complete your requested due diligence on our request for a transcribed interview. We have been patient and accommodating and attempting to work in good faith with your lawyers. Your testimony remains essential to our inquiry. And as such, we welcome your appearance for a transcribed interview on December 2nd at 10 a.m. Not a minute later. Because you are represented by personal counsel in this matter, agency counsel will not be permitted to attend the interview. If you have any questions about these proceedings, please ask your attorneys or contact the staff on your behalf, right? And that's the saying, don't you even think about bringing FBI lawyers, all right? These are your lawyers. You're showing up in your personal capacity. You're not getting government money lawyers. So bring your own. And we've got questions for you, Jill. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Sincerely, Jim Jordan, Mike Johnson, and very nice of them to CC Jerry Nadler, the waddler who waddles around Congress.
with a 35 pound diaper on most days. So very interesting letter coming out from Jim Jordan going over to Jill Sanborn in her personal capacity. And we'll see if we see more of this. I think that the Republicans are going to get a lot more animated. We're going to see a lot more of these letters as the power changes. Now we have a clip from Mike Pence. He is weighing in on some of these issues. Of course, Donald Trump is under a lot of scrutiny. And Mike Pence may want to take advantage of that. Vice President Pence is asked, would you support Donald Trump if he runs again in 2024? You were his vice president after all. We know he's going through a lot right now, different investigations. And what do you think? Would you support him? Mr. Pence, if Donald Trump is the Republican nominee for president in 2024, will you vote for him? Mm. Well, there might be somebody else I'd prefer more. Oh, very clever. Oh, I wonder who that could be. You know, what I can tell you is I'm, I have every confidence that the Republican Party is going to sort out leadership. All my focus has been on the midterm elections, and it'll stay midterms. that way for the next 20 days. But after that, we'll be thinking about the future, ours and the nation's, and uh, I'll keep you posted, okay? What does that mean? I think that means that Mike Pence is running for president. He seems to indicate that he's going to like himself a lot more than he's going to like Donald Trump, and he may be the man he thinks can put him on the sideline. Now, he says he's got a lot of faith in the Republican Party to sort of uh, attend to all of this, but I'm not so sure that the Republican Party is going to be successful in trying to sideline Trump, even though they want to, as we know. But we'll continue to cover that, of course. A lot of updates on the Trump stuff. Thank you for joining us wherever it is you're watching this. I appreciate you subscribing, liking this video so that we can see you on the next one.